Hey guys, for the Apple Reviews here, and today I'll be reviewing Chapter 258 of The Seven Deadly Sins. So the first thing we see in this chapter is the discussion between Meliodas and Zeldaris. You know, uh, Zeldaris is trying, kind of trying to confirm that Meliodas, you're going to keep your promise, right? Like, you're going to do what you said you're going to do when you become the Demon King. And Meliodas just confirming, yes, I will be doing that. We also get a heartwarming kind of moment where Meliodas is like, I'm sorry for being the kind of older brother I am, you know? And it makes me wonder what their relationship was like before all this went down, you know, when Meliodas was still super evil. Uh, maybe, like, just because he was, like, the soul of Meliodas, he was ruthless on the battlefield, maybe he was different, you know, with uh, Esperosa and Zeldaris. Esperosa really looked up to Meliodas, so that brings a lot of questions to mind. I'm really wondering uh, what their relationship was like beforehand, and, you know, maybe that's why Zeldaris is so hurt by Meliodas the train and why he was so mad at them until, you know, just recently in the series. Meliodas then absorbs all the commandments that Zeldris and himself both had, so uh, his power is already insane, and now he's even stronger, so sweet. <laughs> Overpowered as hell right now. Uh, I'm not sure how anyone's going to stop him, and that also brings me to wonder, he has all the commandments, yes, but is Nakaba, like, forgetting the, like, actual effects the commandments have, or the, are those only effective when you have one at a time, you know, like, does this mean he has, like, deity and, like, a... I forget what, everyone, what other ones they have right now, but does it mean he has all of their commandments, or does it mean that he just has the power that's associated with the commandments? Uh, a little more to say than that, because if he has all the commandments on him active at once, or even like a bunch of them like he does now, it seems to make an interesting fight, you know? A lot of interesting, uh, you know, kind of dynamics you can have because of the, the effects of the commandments. The next few pages are uh, a lot of like a geared up versions of all the same, you know, showing their new outfits and uh, how they're ready for battle. The first one we get, of course, is the strongest Hawk Sama. <laughs> Can't even keep a straight face. Uh, Hawk is in his battle gear. He does have a lot of pouches, you know, on his back, so he has, like, food and stuff that he can eat and, you know, utilize powers. And, uh, as far as, like, tag along with little animal buddies go in these kind of series, Hawk is my favorite. I want Hawk to actually do something relevant, because I know he can. I know he can. He's done it before. Hawk is awesome. Following this, we see Elizabeth, who is sensing the massive approach of all the demons and stuff, and how she's, like, expressing worry about that, and, uh, she is in an outfit that does not look good for battle at all. She's gonna be, you know, a healer, you know, kind of like a white mage of, like, the main forces on anything there, called the Search and Destroy or something, second, uh, or force or whatever, but, uh, he just doesn't look ready. I, I get that feelings are things, so, you know, if he gets hurt, whatever, if he just heals herself, as long as it's not a one-shot kill, I, I, I guess, but, I don't know, you think she wears some armor, you know, something, at least not, to, like, a dress, you know, at least wear some chainmail, I, I don't know, like, not that it would really help a lot, but, seems weird to me. Uh, she looks good, though. At least she looks really good. Like, the dress is pretty as hell, and I'm assuming it's just, like, snow white. I mean, everything's black and white in manga, but I'm assuming it's just, like, a straight white dress. That seems like what she'd be wearing right now. The next person we get a child of is Merlin, and she's dressed exactly like I think she should be dressed, you know? Like, she's still looking fine, you know, looking good, <laughs> but, uh, she has, like, some shoulder plates and armor on her hands and her feet and stuff, and, you know, she looks, like, kind of bad already, but kind of not, you know? Just a good shonen balance, if you ask me. I don't know. Bothers me a little bit that Elizabeth is just going into battle basically naked in terms of defense, you know? Like, come on. Uh, anyway, Merlin's looking great, and she's expressing uh, that earlier in the series when uh, she told Arthur and Elizabeth that them awakening their, awakening their powers is, like, essential for them defeating the demon clan, that she didn't really sincerely mean it to Elizabeth because she knew that if she woke in her powers, she'd remember stuff, and she'd die in three days. And uh, I think it's kind of like a little bit of a retcon, just because... Uh, why? I guess, like, why you say it in the first place if you didn't mean it? Like, if you didn't want her to do that, you didn't want her to die, why'd you even, like, bring up the idea in her head that she should master her powers? Doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but, uh, I guess they did need her powers at the time, but it's kind of counterproductive. I don't know. Uh, I think it was a little weird, a little bit of a retcon, uh, is what my opinion of it is, but either way, it was fine. I think it was a nice little sweet moment, and Merlin looks great the whole day, so... The next, the next page. The next page is of Diane making her pose. <laughs> her her pose, and, uh, well, King has a nosebleed immediately, as I'm sure a lot of you readers do who are Diane fans. Um, yeah, looking pretty good there, Diane. <laughs> uh, she mentions that the clothes repair themselves, which is, you know, cool. It's gonna save Nakaba a lot of effort in drawing, you know, 
torn and tattered clothes as the battle goes on and like remembering what's ripped and what's not ripped and you know continuity with that so he doesn't have to worry about that he's, he's stated right now oh, clothes repair themselves making it real easy so piccolo's clothes beam is cool and all but um i think merlin's got one up on it and says like i can never make clothes that amazing because he's you know being a perv and then diane's like no the clothes he made me will always be precious to me which is you know also heartwarming like it's so nice seeing the match if you kind of a couple so following the conversation we see king uh all these panels by the way seeing the other characters it's like they're all out of panel like it's showing them like across the whole page basically which is really cool uh i like when uh things go out of panel in the manga and stuff it's a lot of dragon ball in the really year, early series you know like i think at one point he even hit like the border of a panel and they drew it being broken I, I think stuff like that's really cool. So seeing them out of panel like this really accentuates that, like, yeah, these are all the new designs. Check it out, man. Uh, so we see King's wearing a really cool coat. Uh, King's one of my favorite characters in the series, period. So seeing him in a cool new outfit is awesome. Uh, I think this one looks really cool. And uh, he's actually trying to ask Diane to marry him, which is just adorable seeing how awkward he is. Like, he can't get it out. He's like, will you marry? Diane's like, what are you talking about? He's like, you know what I mean. He just, she just doesn't. He doesn't know what he means at all because he won't say it. Uh, and then Eskinor, being bitter and uh, still upset about what happened in the last chapter, uh, he, he's saying, like, hey, you've got new bump birds, so stop it. So Eskinor is being really bitter about the whole lovey, lovey dovey thing because, you know, Merlin, he thinks Merlin had a lot of feelings for Arthur and that, you know, not him and he doesn't know what to do about it. He's not liking that. He doesn't, uh, yeah, basically his pride is hurt. And because of this, uh, he's bitter. And when we cut to him, we see his new outfit. He looks really cool. Uh, his coat is, his coat is super badass. It's this, it has like a crazy like furry kind of hood thing. And it, like, you know, it looks like a lion's mane. He has like the lion belt and everything. And the design of the pride sins on his back. It's a pretty, it's a pretty nice outfit. I am digging it for sure. Uh, might be my favorite out of all the new outfits, to be honest. <laughs> Next week is, uh, we have Gowther, who is impersonating Merlin with voice mimicry, saying, like, why are you so bitter, Eskinor? You know, basically pointing out that he's super bitter. And uh, Eskinor turns around really excited, and <laughs> it's Gowther, in his, like, kind of, like, semi-cross-dressy outfit. Oh, Gowther, you are the king of trolls for that. Like, y you realize what Eskinor could do to you, right? Eskinor could crumple you up like a pretzel. Like, oh my god, you have fought him before. You've seen how terrifying he is. He didn't even have, like, all of his power. Dear God, <laughs> like, eat the balls on that man. I guess he doesn't have balls, he's a doll, but his metaphorical balls, they're huge. Throughout the whole time that Eskinor has been talking to people, he's been, like, kind of coughing every now and then, and uh, after we see him walk away really angrily from uh, Gowther and his mega troll, uh, we see him cough again, but this time he has blood in his hand, and uh, that's interesting. Uh, I can only think of two possibilities here. One being that, uh, what Reducius was saying about, like, his, like, hu a human body can't handle this blessing. That turned out to be true. It seems like a more likely, uh, option that, like, it's just, like, he's been using it so much more recently, and that he's had it for so many years, that, like, it's finally starting to actually take its toll, even though Eskinor has been so good at containing it until now. And the other possible I think, and the one I would prefer, is that his pride is hurt, so he's physically hurt. Like, his pride is directly tied to sunshine. Like, his sunshine ability is no longer really just purely sunshine. It, when it came into contact with his body and uh, mixed with the whole pride aspect, it became kind of a new magic power. And uh, one of the downsides could be that when his pride is hurt, when he's not feeling as prideful as he could be, you know, like, he's, he's in physical pain and he can't, like, draw out his true power. And that would be really, really interesting going through in a cool way to nerf Eskinor so that he is still really strong but, you know, not at his full. So that's an obstacle to overcome, and it kind of ties into what well, I was saying last chapter of you, how I want to see something mentally, you know, give us a hard time. Next, we see all the knights parading through the town, going off to war, all the citizens cheering after them, and uh, the Breath of Bliss or whatever reduced will use on them, which seemingly increased their power levels, which is, you know, really good for them, obviously. They uh, are all very weak compared to the demons. Um, it also affects the humans in the brainwashing way. That's how they brainwash you. And uh, they all seem like just hell bent on just kill, kill, kill. Which uh, is not good in the town. It makes them look kind of bad. Death Pierce seemed like kick someone out of the way. And uh, he's always seemed like a really honorable guy. So I think that's really out of character. Um, it's affecting them pretty. So it affects stronger people, too, is what I'm trying to get at there. Uh, Death Pierce may not be like, obviously, he's not 7 Deadly Sin level, but he's like stronger than your average Holy Knight. And uh, so, for it to affect him, it shows that it can affect a lot of strong people. Uh, turns out Hendrickson is immune, though, and that Hendrickson specifically isn't 
under the effect of this, which is so disappointing, dude. I already don't want to see that, like, I know I just said that, like, I don't want to see more brainwashing stuff, that's already been a thing, and that now, you know, Henderson isn't brainwashed, I guess I should be happy and not complaining, but, like, ah, oh, Hendrickson, why, why are you just, with, with, this guy possessed Margaret, and he's just totally fine with it, he's just totally cool, she, he's the greatest, and he's just kind of dick riding him now, uh, I really hope that, it turns out that he, like, has an ulterior motive, and, like, maybe he's trying to, like, you know, backstab or do so when he knows that he's going to betray them. You know, something, something that Henderson is doing, because I don't want to see his character be kind of just wasted with the blind following of Reduce Really don't. Uh, I trust him not about it. I think he's an impulse to be cool, but as of now, I'm just really disappointed in Henderson. Like, come on, man. Come on. We see uh, Gil, Hauser, and Graham Moore all part ways, and them saying, like, hey, like, you guys come back alive, kind of stuff. You know, like, all of you do your best, you know, just Real motivational thing. We're kind of seeing a lot of people before the war starts, you know, it's kind of cutting to all of them really briefly. And uh, I can see one of these three guys dying, for sure. People have to die in this war, otherwise, just, this, the tension won't be there. So, we're just going to give a speech about going to war and whatnot, and then uh, right when it ends, uh, Essendor's like, Yeah, hey, you're going to have to cut your speech kind of short there, bud. Uh, he's noticing what's going on, and then everyone starts to see, and we get, wow, a really cool page with a bunch of Albions, a bunch of Red Demons, a bunch of Grey Demons. Demons and demon weapons everywhere, and uh, it looks terrifying. It looks absolutely terrifying. And then all the forces charging against each other, and the Holy War officially starts. It's going. Like, I thought it would be at least one, maybe two more chapters of setup. Nope. Here, <laughs> we're going. We're going in strong. And uh, I'm excited. That page is really cool, and I like that there's more Albions. Uh, I knew there were weapons in the, you know, the Holy War, but I kind of forgot that, you know, they were, like, plentiful in the demon realm. And now the seal's pretty much destroyed. Uh, you know, they got, they got more. <laughs> and see how, see how much trouble they had with the first two that showed up? I want to see King, uh, especially King, just easily take out them out, you know, because now he's so much stronger, and it shouldn't even be, like, an issue for him. That'd be really cool. You know, nice little progression thing there. So that's pretty much it for this chapter, guys. Uh, it was a really good one. I liked it. It was obviously set up, but it was a good setup. It was uh, setting up really well. Everything's ready to go. The Holy War's going to go into full swing next chapter, and uh, I'm pretty stoked, guys. These kind of war arcs can be hit or miss, but, you know, uh, I got I got faith in Nakaba. I think he's going to give us some pretty epic battles, some epic brawls going down. Like, one Chandler and Q-Sex show up on this battlefield, the one that, you know, all the sins and humans and Sigma are in. Man, I think you're going to get Crazy. So, <laughs> looking forward to that. Uh, yeah, like, comment, subscribe if you enjoyed the video, guys. And uh, yeah, until next time, I'll see you guys.